Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marius Varga, I'm from Plymouth University and uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the virtual reality simulation of a simulated tadpole spinal cord. Um, so <clears throat> the talk is going to be divided in two parts. The first part, I'm just going to cover the models that we use for visualization of the, uh, in, in virtual reality. And the second part, I'm just going to talk about our visualization itself and basically about why we chose virtual reality to do this and all its benefits and how basically enhances understanding on, on uh, uh, inter with, through interactivity and contextualized information. <clears throat> so uh, our main protagonist here is uh, the tadpole and basically is this particular specimen here is two days old, it's about five millimeters long. And the reason we chose this is even though it has thousands of neurons in, in, in the network, it has, uh, in, in this particular simulation for the model, it's, it's been using only seven neur neuron types. So basically it's relatively, relatively simple comparing to other creatures. So that makes it an ideal candidate for that. So, uh, at this young age, the tadpole has two typical uh, behaviors. Uh, one of them is swigging, swimming uh, uh, as a response to any touch or any kind of interaction with the skin. The skin and is innervated and it's connected to the neurons. And that uh, initial touch creates a swimming motion. Uh, it's an odd behavior because you can't really see at this young age. So what is doing the tadpole, it's going to swim until it hits an obstacle or reaches the surface of the water. And right at the bottom, probably around here, it has a cement gland and the tadpole is going to attach itself to the surface. So it's basically, it's more like a reaction, it's like a reflex. And the struggling is basically is a response to predators uh, basically attacking the tadpole. So it's responding usually to pinched movement. So um, experiments were created in the lab where basically trying to grab the tadpole. And it's creating a struggling uh, behavior which actually swims backwards with a higher amplitude and uh, lower intensity. <clears throat> so. The spinal cord, this is a cross-section of the spinal cord uh, representation. So, like I said earlier, it has a few thousand neurons, but um, the neurons, the way they're situated, uh, right at the top, sorry, let me find out. I think the, the yellow section down here, uh, what it has uh, is the wrong bead neurons, and those are the neurons connected to the skin uh, nerves, basically. So any touch, they behave like an on-off kind of switch for any touch, they will trigger the initial spike. And that will propagate uh, the spike, the swimming uh, pattern throughout the, the neurons that exist on the sides of the, of the spinal cord. Uh, down here, you, you can't see it in this image, but all around the, the walls of the spinal cord, we have the other types of neuron. And right at the bottom, we have the motor neurons. Uh, next to the floor plate. You're going to see it better in a, uh, in a slide later on. So um, <clears throat> this is basically the growth model that's been used. There's two different type of models. One of them is the growth model that uh, was used to generate the neural network. And the second one was the functional model that was used. So what we see here is the growth model. And as you can see, um, Basically, it was divided, uh, it's using a 2D element to grow the model in, on the X and Y values. And the way that's been achieved, I'm just going to back to the previous slide, uh, it's been using the, the spinal cord, as you can see the dotted line at the top. It basically dissect, it longitudinally dissected the spinal cord in two, and two halves were open as a two sheets of paper, if you, if you like. And based on that uh, shape, uh, we will be able to generate a growth model for the spinal cord. So uh, we get the neurons growing. And uh, the, the growth model, basically, it's simulating the, the growth itself according to chemical gradients. So uh, 
we use uh, optimized to, uh, gradients were optimized to match statistics of real axons uh, with data that came from uh, Bristol University. Uh, they're doing a lot of research on tadpoles. And uh, <clears throat> the model itself created the connections between uh, the neurons uh, where synapses were, were added. Uh, when synapses met the dendrites, basically, uh, were creating a connection. So in total, there are about 80,000 synapses in, in the model and about 1,400 neurons. <coughs> Simulating the model, basically, this is the functional model that uh, we're looking at. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been using uh, the Hodgkin Huxley type neurons uh, to, to generate connectivity. And, uh, the membrane parameters were tuned to match the electrophysiological data. And uh, I don't know if you can see on here on the graph on the, on the right. Uh, right, this is where we, the swing pattern exists basically, it's being shown as, a, as an outcome. So there's a yellow dot, that yellow dot basically is the initial touch on wrong bead neurons, they're being triggered. And uh, that touch generates the swing pattern, you can see it, it kind of, uh, got into a symmetry, and all the green, green dots on the image are motor neurons, basically, that are being fired on both sides of the tadpole. So uh, <clears throat> basically using this data, uh, we, we moved to the visualization model, and I'm gonna talk how, how those two models were being integrated in, in visualization. So uh, using those two models, uh, there was a lot of data being generated for, for the models. First of all, we had to grow the, the neural network and to visualize it. And the second, we had to create the spiking system uh, so, we can, uh, so we can show that. So uh, obviously for that, we chose a VR visualization because uh, the sheer amount of data that in there is very difficult to interpret and, and see. So the visualization, what we've done, uh, we recreated the spinal cord in three dimension. As I said earlier, because we had those two sheets of paper, that, uh, the metaphor basically for two sheets of paper where the, the <laughs> accents were grown. Uh, what we've done, we put those two together by just uh, bending the sheets of paper and creating again the spinal cord. So we recreated the shape that we had originally. And, um, there was a random variation added to the data, so we get a bit of a thickness on the wall, so it's gonna be a bit more accurate uh, representation of the real, uh, real actions. Uh, we have seven types of neurons, the, all the neurons that are being used, uh, they're being uh, uh, visualized in there. Obviously, they're color-coded to match the, the initial data. Uh, somas are represented by cubes, and basically the actions are represented by lines, so we chose uh, this kind of representation to keep uh, to the minimum the, 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 the strain on the GPU, we try to, to be as efficient as possible because it's an interactive element, uh, so we, we need to stick to a certain frame rate. There's no dendrites in this visualization, although we have the data for it, uh, but we're planning to introduce them in the future, so. Uh, This is actually a mid image from uh, visualization itself. Uh, this is what's being created. Uh, probably in here at the top, you can see the wrong big neurons, the yellow type neurons, basically that the initial trigger for the swing pattern. And uh, down here at the bottom, this is the floor plate. And on green, colored on green here, you will see the motor neurons uh, themselves, basically that creating the alternative uh, swing pattern. Um, you might see these blue streaks of light, uh, of, of color, basically. What they are, those are the spiking neurons being fired. Those are commissural neurons firing and going across the spinal cord from one side to the other to create the, the, the symmetry in swimming. Um, if you try this in VR, uh, basically you will be able to get really close to any type of neuron and uh, just observe the, the motion. Probably if you use this, I would suggest you to sit somewhere right in the middle of this and you will see the swimming pythons go alternatively on both sides. So uh, the, f the fact that you can choose your point of view gives you a bit more clarity for, uh, for looking at the data. 
So uh, I'm just going to cover a bit of uh, technology, what type of technology we use. Uh, as a rendering uh, element, we use Unity 3D. Uh, Unity is basically a game engine in itself, but it's being used for um, serious simulations. And the reason we chose this is very versatile in deploying to different platforms. Uh, we, at the moment, we're doing only on Windows, but uh, it's, it's going to be very easy to deploy to Mac or other platforms for people to, to, to look at this type of data. Um, and basically, the second uh, important device that we use with the visualization is Oculus Rift, which is the stereoscopic uh, device. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about uh, virtual reality a bit and how uh, this device uh, is placed in, in, in virtual reality. So uh, virtual reality is basically a medium that simulates uh, physical presence in an imaginary environment or a real setting basically using technology. So in a nutshell, we use technology to, in order to enhance our presence in that 3D world. Um, the, main, the main device here is the headset, like I said earlier. Uh, it's, it's very important to create that sense of immersion by, by using the stereoscopic vision. Um, there are other devices out there, uh, but this is one of uh, pre pretty useful for us because it's very accessible. Uh, the code is very accessible. And what it has, probably you can see down here, it has uh, a motion sensor, uh, sorry, a depth sensor that reads uh, the headset and basically translates all that information into the virtual environment. So uh, that's very important because if that's not accurate enough or if it's uh, slowing down the system, you will get motion sickness, which is something that we try to avoid. Uh, we use 3D sounds in the environment, so we get uh, more sense of immersion to people. So uh, we, we have different cues that are being triggered, like buttons and different uh, visual audio cues besides the visual cues. Um, so um, we, we use the head tracking, like we said, for, for Rift. And at the moment, we're not using any haptic devices in our visualization, but uh, it's, it, it, it's possible in the future. There's a few uh, bits of kit coming onto the market, uh, but at the moment we, we're not using any of that. I just will, I would like to talk about the units and scale at the moment, just just for a second. Uh, so the initial models, uh, the, the the parameters coming out are uh, for one unit basically is one micron, and for a, a tick in the simulation uh, of firing action is basically a millisecond. So the way we translated that in Unity, I've just put a comparison there so you get an idea. Usually Unity, what it does is using one unit in Unity as one meter for a physics uh, simulation purposes, so they create more f accurate uh, physics. So what we've done, we, we match one unit in Unity to one micrometer. So basically one micron from coming from the, from the simulation into, into Unity. And that gives us basically a huge uh, spinal cord of a tadpole, which in real world, that will, that will come to like 1.5 kilometers. So uh, basically, you will fly in an environment where, where you in this huge tadpole. It's not scary, I promise you. <laughs> so uh, what we try to, the reason we use VR is because of the immersive element. Uh, one of the best way of investing in any, any kind of element, as, as we know, even the kids, they, they pick objects, they look at them, they touch them. Obviously, we didn't do that with haptic devices, but the way that uh, we use VR is to, to immerse the players so they can choose their own point of view in that particular world, so they can look at elements from their own point of view uh, and uh, feel like they're present, uh, they're present in there. So we use that uh, to maximize uh, that effect. So scale, like I said earlier, is very important because it's quite big, allows you to get really close to any kind of uh, connections or any neuron. Uh, interactivity, uh, we, we can create this exploratory system where you can go anywhere and you can look at anything from any points of view. And I've covered the sounds already. But what we have an additional element is the contextualized information uh, basically, this is knowledge from the expert being given to the user of the system, whoever it is. We do have some uh, control over the, over the time scale, basically, in the, in the 
firing of the neuron visualization. Uh, we could have full control, uh, but we didn't implement that. This is more like uh, uh, um, people getting uh, engaged with the system rather than uh, controlling it for, for uh, minute differences. In order to, to help users uh, uh, explore this environment a bit more, we created a starting scene called the pond scene, basically, where we're trying to contextualize this information that they're going to receive. So uh, the user starts in the pond scene. It, uh, it's surrounding peaceful environment, nature-like, uh, and there's a tadpole. And as we click on the tadpole, we basically we dive in inside the tadpole, and we start to see all these elements. Um, the reason we've done that, for people who've never used this kind of technology, VR, there's a bit of a shock to just going straight and assimilating a lot of new information and just dealing with the tech at the same time. So what we try to do, create that initial start just using the, the, the tech first and then getting, uh, dishing out the information. Uh, this is a screenshot of the, of the pawn scene. But, um, as you can see in here as well, we played a bit with the scale, you actually like probably a third the size of a human, uh, so you're very close to the water and close to the tadpole. Okay, so we did have some challenges with this. It uh, wasn't easy. Uh, basically, the aim was to, to hit 75 frames per second in VR, uh, and considering it's being rendered to both eyes, basically, we literally we had to run at 150 FPS. Uh, the reason we do that is the refresh rate for the uh, VR headset for Rift is basically 75 hertz, and we had to, we try to match that in order to to uh, eliminate any motion sickness. Uh, so uh, we pushing around half a million quads in the in the rendering world. Um, so we had to do some some stuff. Unity as out of the box doesn't deal very well with all these elements. So the meshes weren't optimized, the shaders were not properly rendering, so, but the frame rate was dropping. Uh, we had to create chunking system and animation system specifically for this type of data so we can deal with this, so we can increase the frame rate. I'm just gonna quickly talk to a scenario of how we basically, we created a mesh just for, for this system. So the initial, um, what we've done, we, we got values for the axon basically, which came at 2D points in, in the world. So we preserve that information and we create like a 3D rendering uh, data, set of data from the initial data. And uh, this, uh, this the red dot, uh, black dots basically, that's the information that came from the original data. So what we've done, we create a couple of vertices on each side of it. And uh, we try to generate the, the, the simplest shape in 3D, which is a triangle. So uh, connecting those two uh, dots uh, with a line, it was basically putting two triangles together, which uh, uh, created a quad, in, in, to be fair. So uh, once we created that uh, connection between two points, we had a lot of lines in there, a lot of values. So we had to uh, connect all these dots. We could... Uh, we could make everything more efficient, basically. We could interpolate between some lines, but we, we wanted to preserve the original data, so we didn't touch that. Um, so what we decided to do, we decided to join all the lines into a mesh. We made it a bit more efficient. The only problem, the culling system, it wasn't as efficient as it was supposed to be, uh, having these long meshes which were going longitudinally. Uh, so we had to create a chunking system where we cut the meshes into the right uh, size uh, in order to improve the culling. So um, it was nearly there quite working. The only element that we still had was issue with the rendering. The shaders were on, weren't optimized, so we had to write some custom shaders to make the, the, the rendering more efficient. So we made it double-sided so you can see it from both sides. And uh, in the end, we, we achieve our uh, frame rate, basically, 75. Um, Okay, so future direction, basically, this, this kind of uh, system can be used for scientific uh, visualization in VR, giving you access to the data a very close range, allowing you to basically interact with that particular data. We don't have it for this particular demo that we have here this week, but uh, we, we have a, a, a version where we can interact with any, any neuron or axon, click on it and get information about that. 
Um, specific to this model, we can create basically a master system, physics-based, and we can generate swimming based on the neuron input uh, and get the, the muscles to contract and, and relax based on the information. Uh, but uh, again, early days in there. So in conclusion, uh, basically, I hope I covered most of the elements about uh, VR and the, the models that we use uh, the data from. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. Uh, and just one slide, I would like to thank a lot of other people, but these, these, these are the main people that helped with the, with the project and the, most of the work was based up on them. So thank you very much. <laughs> or we can continue informally over coffee. Okay, okay so we Thank have uh, 25 <coughs> minutes. We will reconvey at 5 minutes to 11. Uh, let's thank the speakers for this morning. Thank, thank you. you.